let's turn together in God's Word to the book of Romans, and we'll be looking at verses 27 through 31 this morning, Romans 3, verses 27 through 31, where God's Word reads as follows. <clears throat> then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that no one, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So far, the reading from God's Word, may He add its blessing to our hearts this morning. It's been my experience that you, it is very important to learn social conventions when you move from place to place. I've lived in three different countries, and each of them has different ways of expressing thanksgiving. And, and even in our own country, from region to region, there are different ways to express ways uh, to express gratitude uh, for things that are done in kindness. So, for example, when gifts are given, it is polite to write a card or to give somebody a hug or to express gratitude for that gift. And if you don't do any of those things, the person who has extended that kindness to you might be under the impression that you despise them and despise their gifts, even though. On the inside, you might be very grateful for it nonetheless. And so what is true in human relationships is all the more true in the aspect of considering salvation, uh, our relationship with the giver of salvation, the, the God of heaven. Uh, the Bible is a book not of rules. It's not a book of having ways to improve your life. It's not a book that helps you strengthen your relationships, or get a promotion at your job. No, the Bible is a book that presents one specific glorious truth, and that is the gift of salvation, where God gives to the dead human soul a gift that can never be repaid. Not only does he give it to a dead human soul, but the, the death of that soul actually is a rottenness with relationship to God. Because the dead soul salvation, this, this precious gift that you can never repay, that soul has actually been idolatrous. It has replaced the God who should be worshipped with a God of his own imagination. He has, as, as we've seen this morning in our call to confession, he has been a dead soul who has expressed his death in blaspheming the name of God. Not necessarily with his lips, but in how we think of him, or, or, or even how we act out our, our Christian life. The, the dead soul that receives salvation from God is a dead soul that has despised the worship of God. God having given one day in seven for worship, and the dead soul says, no, I, I'd rather not. The, the dead soul who has rejected the authorities that God has given has despised those others made in God's image, the ones who have have embraced sexual immorality, whether it be in the mind or in action, the one who has been ungrateful for the things that God has given and has stolen or has coveted, the one who has despised God's name, who is truth by speaking that which is not true, that is the dead soul. And to that dead soul, God has presented this way of salvation. And the way of salvation says all of this imperfection well, imperfection is a euphemism, isn't it? But all of this sin, all of this rebellion against God, I will take it from you, and I will nail it to the cross of Christ, and so you will be free, free from eternal condemnation that should be yours, and instead you will have this eternal life which belongs to another. That is the glorious message of the gospel, which is the greatest gift that could ever be given. And as that gift is freely applied, we have to ask ourselves something. 
Is it really appropriate for us to continue in these ways that cause Christ to be nailed to the cross? Is it right for us to continue in these ways which show that we despise this redemption purchased by Christ's blood? And the text that we're considering together this morning gives an answer. And the answer is a resounding no. It is not appropriate to continue to walk in the ways that caused Christ to be nailed to the cross in the first place. The, the Christian's thankful response to the gospel is loving God by obedience to his commandments. And so we're going to learn that lesson today by thinking about two things. First, we're going to have a remedial lesson on what it means to be justified by faith. And in the second place, we're going to talk about what it means to uphold the law. So we want to see the Christian's thankful response to the gospel is loving God by obedience to his commandments. We want to look at what it means to be justified by faith, and we want to look at what it means to uphold the law. So first we'll consider what it means to be justified by faith. So Paul here is taking up this great theme of justification by faith again. Uh, justification, just by way of, of background, it, it is a twofold theological description. When we talk about being justified, we're talking about what it means when God, through Christ, pardons our sin, and declares us righteous, or counts us as righteous. So there's a, there's a two-part. Not only does he take what is negative in you and pardon it, so he removes the guilt of your sin, but more than that, he doesn't leave you in a neutral place. He actually counts you as righteous. So whatever he thought of Christ, he thinks that of you now, because the righteousness of Christ is, is counted as belonging to you. And, and that's what's happening in justification. And, and Paul's revisiting this theme again. But, but he's not necessarily reviewing the theology of it so much as he is showing the consequence of doctrine. So uh, man's, well, all actions have a, have a corresponding reaction. And, and that's true. We see that in, in kind of the, 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 the plight of humanity. If, if, you, if, if we think about the fall of man into sin, and, and the pride that first was, was lifted up by Eve and Adam as they ate against God's direct commandment in, and they ate the forbidden fruit and, and, and all of that, you see man exalting himself ever since. The, the first action is this fall into sin, this rebellion against God. And, and since that time, man is on this, on, this, on this trajectory, on this road that he can't get off of. His, his nature is corrupt, his his father is corrupt, and, and so corruption is the way of man. And so that is seen uh, in man because he, he desires to rescue himself from this. A plight he knows, knows it to be poor, and he tries to rescue himself. And how does man try to rescue himself? Well, he does it in different ways. He, he tries to do well enough so that God will be pleased with him. He tries to diminish the significance of God by making a God after his own imagination who who doesn't get quite as upset about the sins that the Bible describes as, as condemning, so on. And so you see in humanity this trajectory from the beginning after sin, man having this impulse to self-justify, to, to say, I will earn my own salvation. Now Paul, in the book of Romans so far, has labored hard to crush that notion. And he has made us squirm a little bit. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, he's really not let us get away with a sense that, that we're doing all right. That all we need is just a little bit of help. No, Paul has shown us very plainly the great sinfulness of man. Man is, is corrupt. He, he doesn't do righteous. He doesn't seek after God. He's turned aside. He's become worthless. His throat's an open grave. Right? I'm reading from... Romans 3, verse 10 through 18. That's the biblical record of, of and Paul has set that before us. And, and more than that, not only has he shown us how poorly we are doing, but he has compared that with the righteousness of God. God who is pure. God, God who is, is holy. This, this God who is faithful when we are not faithful. And so then uh, he has shown us that this righteousness that God has, which we must have to avoid condemnation, comes to us only in one way. There's only one vehicle that, that, that transfers 
transfers the righteousness of Christ to an under and that is this notion of faith. Faith not being a work that man contributes, but faith being an awakening that God gives within the human being and which he uses to transfer Christ's righteousness. And the conclusion at the beginning of our text is that that work of God in us and the exclusivity with which God works salvation in a human being it, it eliminates something from our spiritual vocabulary. There's one thing that we shouldn't be able to speak about when it comes to our spiritual vocabulary, and at the beginning of our text it says it's boasting. There's no reason to celebrate anything about ourselves because man is passive in his justification. Man is passive, no room for him to take credit for anything at all. Now, Paul has expressed that in a different place. In the book of 1 Corinthians, he has expressed the same thing. So 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7 says, What do you have that you did not receive? What's the answer? Nothing. So if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? That's the reality in salvation. In salvation, the, Christ, the Christian receives everything by a gift, and there is no room for boasting. There's, there's no room for bragging on the part of the Christian. Look at what I have done. So man is, man is justified by faith. But it says that man, well, it's, it presents two different ways that man seeks to, or one other, sorry, one alternate way that man seeks to justify himself. And in verse 27, it talks about this law of works. Is it, is it the law of works that excludes boasting? No, it is the law of faith. Now, the law of works versus the law of faith, is that talking about a different set of rules, this law of faith? Is that a, a new set of rules that we can find somewhere other than in Exodus 20 and, and Deuteronomy 5, where we find the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God? Summarize. No, it's not talking about a new set of rules. It's talking about the way of man. So how do you come to the way of salvation? Have you chosen the way of salvation that is built on doing? Is it by the law of works or is it by the law of faith? Do you come to the Lord by the way of believing? Well, Paul says the law of faith is the only way that you can come. And since there is no boasting because of the law of faith that means that works are excluded. So, so Paul is presenting, in some sense, contrasting covenant obligations. If you think about how God relates to his creation, he has done it in two ways. Before sin enters into the world, God related to his creation, to man, by a covenant of works, which said, this is the, this is the law of works. You work and God gives you life. And on the contrast, there is the obligation of the covenant of grace, which God puts into place when man falls into sin. And, and that covenant of grace doesn't say you work and you have life. It says you believe. You believe that Christ has worked and you have life. And so Paul here is explaining and setting before us these two different ways of approaching. You can approach God through his law, as if it is a covenant of works to you. That is the, the way of doing. And we have seen many times in Romans that that is your destruction. And then Paul has presented for us that there is this other way to come to God, which is this law of faith, this way of believing, and under the covenant of grace, that is the way that salvation is communicated to mankind. So Paul has made it clear that man isn't able Neither is he willing to obey God. And, and here he's repeating himself. He's, he's saying that it is only by faith, apart from the works of the law, that you are justified, that you are pardoned of your sin and declared to be righteous. The covenant of works, the doing and living, it's impossible for man. Man, man can't do it, but Christ does. It is fulfilled by Christ. The obedience that brings life in the covenant of works 
is still in effect. It's not that when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, well, now I don't care about sin anymore. It doesn't bother me. So now it doesn't matter if you sin. If, if you only believe, then you're going to be justified. That, that's not how God has operated. God has seen in humanity, he knows it because he's set it in order. He knows that hum, in humanity there is no good thing. And that man in his own state, in his natural state, is unable ever to bring himself to God. And so he doesn't say, it doesn't matter, my law can be disregarded. But Christ comes. He sends Christ to do that what we cannot do. And our obligation then is to believe what Christ has done. That is what Paul is reminding us again here in this text as well. <clears throat> that we don't come to God by doing, we come to God by believing. And as we have seen before, we see again here in verse 29 and 30, the playing field is level. In chapter 3 and verse 1, we saw that the Jews had an advantage. These were the, this is the covenant family of God from the Old Testament. They had an advantage. <laughs> it's an advantage of exposure, though. Because in verse 9, we see that the Jews aren't any better off. So they have better exposure because they have the covenant blessings that, that come to the people who are under covenant, but they are not any better off unless something is true, unless they have faith. And that's the same thing for the Jew and uh, the Gentile. It says in our text in verse 29, God will justify the circumcised, those who are in covenant, he will justify them by faith, and those also who are outside of covenant, the uncircumcised, he will justify them by faith as well through Christ, through his works. Because, remember verse 23, all have sinned. That's the universal condition of humanity. All have sinned. There's no one who, come to God, who can come to God and say, I have done well enough. And so we're justified in the same way. All must know Christ and his work. All must agree that he is who he says he is then all must entrust themselves entirely to that promise of salvation by Christ through faith. And throughout the history of humanity, this very central doctrine that we have been justified by faith, people have taken it and they've run in the wrong direction with this teaching. And they've said, maybe not verbatim, but their thinking has shifted. So man is justified by faith, therefore the law is bad, and therefore the law is dangerous. And Paul addresses that here in this text. Uh, he's going to address it in more detail in chapter 6. But here he gives us a little foretaste that we wouldn't run away with this notion of what it means to be justified by faith. And so that's what we're going to look at next. What does it mean? What is our relationship with the law now? And in verse 31... He asked a rhetorical question. Do we then overthrow, overthrow the law by this faith? That's the temptation that humanity has always taken up when it faces this doctrine of justification by faith. And Paul says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So we have all of this weight in the book of Romans, all of this momentum that, that sets before us the free offer of the gospel, which is to be received by faith alone. It's, it's built up so far. It's, it's being stressed. And the working of man is minimized and even described as benefiting nothing. And so the temptation can be that we then dismiss the laws of God as important. But here the Apostle Paul in verse 31 plainly says that the principle of faith does not overthrow the law. In fact, Paul's language is very firm. Does justification by faith allow us to overthrow the law? What is Paul's answer. It has an exclamation mark behind it. They don't have exclamation marks in Greek. But the, the, the force of the Greek words are by no means, may it never be. It is like you're receiving a text in all caps when somebody's yelling at you, right, on your, on your phone. That's the, same, that's the same force of the words in the Greek language. May it never be, by no means, justification by faith never overthrows the law. Now, there can be a fail, failure among Christians to take what Paul is applying to the moment of justification 
and spread it throughout the whole Christian life. The call to a life free from striving is only applicable to the parts of salvation in which man is passive. God's choosing. You have no way of influencing that. You, you are entirely passive. There's nothing that you can do that will influence God's choice one direction or the other. Uh, when, when, when you are born again, you are like a child that's coming out of the womb. You are passive in that. You, you, you didn't ask to be made, and you're, be, you're being delivered without consideration of your own timetable. You're passive in this moment. No amount of work that you can do could lead to you being born again. Faith, uh, from Ephesians 2 and verse 8 and following, we know that this is a gift from God given to you by the Holy Spirit. And, and when you repent of your sins, it's not something that originates in your spiritual corpse. This is something that God has done, and there's no amount of work that you can do that would, that would move God to say, well, he deserves faith now, or, or he deserves this gift of repentance. When you are justified, when you are declared righteous, it's not because of your doing. We've seen that over and over again in Romans. It is God's gracious gift. And when you are adopted into God's family as a son and a daughter or a daughter through Christ, that has nothing to do with what you have done, but it is God's gracious work in you. But does that mean that obedience to God is a dangerous thing? Part of the gospel promise is free salvation without works through faith. But is that all of your salvation? Is that all that God promises that he will do for you in salvation? Does that remove the obligation to obedience to God? Well, there is so much scripture that says otherwise. And nothing may be clearer than what Christ says in Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is talking and he says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So what is Christ from his own lips? What is he testifying to? He's, he's saying that the law of God should not be despised, but the law of God should be upheld. Even as Paul is saying here in verse 31, that doesn't only apply to the three remaining years that Jesus has as he teaches on earth. Can you imagine it? Jesus says in Matthew 5, you know, you don't, I'm, I'm here to fulfill the law, uh, keep teaching it, keep doing it, you'll be blessed if you do. Does that only count when Jesus is on earth and then when he ascends into heaven now, the obligation to the law is gone because he's fulfilled it and he's, he's died on the cross? What does Paul say? By no means. The free offer of the gospel does not overflow, overthrow the law. In the biblical record, that would be unthinkable. Justification by faith is no way encourages uh, an overthrow of the law. Instead, it encourages us to uphold the law. The keeping of the law is encouraged. In our catechism, the larger catechism, Number 97, it talks about the use of the law of God for the regenerate. And it says that the regenerate has much use in the law of God in showing thanks by, I quote, their greater care to conform themselves thereunto as the rule of their obedience. Their greater care to conform themselves thereunto as the rule of their obedience. What is the, what is the catechism saying? The catechism is saying, if you understand the gospel and the freedom of the gospel has been applied to you, you will have greater care to apply the law of God. It will be more important to you than it was before. You will desire to be more faithful in obeying God's commandments. 
So justification by faith doesn't overthrow the law, but it gives you greater care to keep it. What is God's purpose as part of your salvation after he has justified you? Well, you look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1.15. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy, how? In the things that you know? No, be holy in all your conduct. That's what the Word of God says. Now, what does holiness in my conduct look like? In my sanctification, I'm I'm, I'm called to be holy. God is making me holy. Well, what is holiness? You can just go a couple of chapters further in in the book of Romans, and we look at chapter 7 and verse 12. How do I know what holiness is? So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous, and good. So if I want to know what it looks like to be holy as God is holy, as He calls me to be, as He works in me through that part of my salvation that goes beyond the parts where I am entirely passive, when it talks about me learning to work out my own salvation as God gives me the strength to do it, as as it talks about me putting to death what is earthly in me and putting on the righteousness that is in heaven, where do I look? Well, I look to the law of God, because there I find holiness. There I find a description of what is righteous and good. So yes, justification is by faith alone. But justification doesn't give you freedom to overthrow the law. Now how might we overthrow the law? There are different ways that we can overthrow the law. One way is, of course, fairly obvious, through blatant disobedience. We overthrow the law. There can be active disobedience against God's law in the Christian from a presumption on his grace. This is the Christian who who drinks to excess, who who is profane in his speech, who gives way to his passions and, and, and says it's okay because I have been justified by faith. These Christians use liberty as a cover for personal sin. But the freedom that is purchased for you in justification doesn't give you freedom to do what nailed Christ to the cross in the first place. The freedom that has been purchased for you is so that you might live according to 1 Peter 1 and verse 15, that the one who called you is holy, that you also may be holy in all your Conduct, not just in parts of it, but we strive for purity and holiness in all our conduct. And when we disobey blatantly what the law of God says, we overthrow the law. It's it's fairly obvious. But we can also overthrow the law by starving it, by neglecting it, by pretending that it is not important. And that comes... Usually, when we neglect God's law from an unbalanced understanding of what grace is, we emphasize one aspect of God's work of salvation, the aspect where we're passive, and that's a glorious part of salvation. We should should never neglect it, and we should lift it up and glorify God for, for bringing salvation to undeserving sinners because of Christ's righteousness, His death on the cross communicated to us by faith. But we must consider all of our salvation, not just part of it. There are other components of our salvation. There are some that happen right at the beginning of your Christian walk, in which you are entirely passive. You're you're a dead corpse at the bottom of the spiritual ocean. There's no way for you to respond. But God makes you alive. That's part of your salvation too. This this period where he gives you time and days and a mind and hands and feet to carry out what holiness looks like. So after your rebirth, after your conversion, after your justification, after your adoption, many will come and say, well, I'm kind of free from law-keeping, or law-keeping isn't all that important. But is Jesus right to say that the person who does and teaches the law of God is great in the kingdom of heaven. 
Is, is there any value in considering what the Christian should live like? To consider the biblical commands about vocation or financial stewardship or, or marriage or, or parenting? Is that, is that neglecting justification by faith alone? Well, the book of Romans says, by no means. That is not neglecting your justification. When the law is neglected in the name of not disturbing the message of grace, you are overthrowing the law. And Romans says, may that never be. So there's this wonderful circle in the Bible that we can, we can observe. Leaving aside the law, the Christian returns to the law. Isn't it amazing? We, we say we can't come to God by the law. But because God has brought us to himself, what are we faced with? The law. So there's this wonderful circle in the, in the Christian life. It's a, it's a simple matter of perspective when you're talking about the law. Your attitude towards the law changes depending on what aspect of your salvation you're thinking about. Before your regeneration and conversion and justification, adoption, the law is it's kind of like pushing a, a two-ton stone ball up a hill. Say, by some miracle, you were able to move that, that stone a little bit up a hill. That's you pushing the law so that you will be justified. And you will get far enough on that hill where that two-ton stone will be too much for you, and it will crush you. It will destroy you. But if you start at the top of the hill and you're looking down at the jungle of life and all the decisions that I must make, that two-ton ball now goes hurdles down the hill in front of you and clears a path. That's the difference of perspective. If I'm using it at the point of my justification, that law will crush me. It will destroy me. But after my justification, if I'm seeking to find the way of what it, what it means to walk in a way that is pleasing to God without getting lost in the woods, that law will clear the way for me. It will actually show me what I'm supposed to do. Before you are regenerated, before you are justified, the law is like biking into a Category 5 hurricane. You do that, and your little bicycle and you on it will be picked up and you'll be hurled however many miles away, and you will be destroyed. That is your life seeking to conquer the law or to conquer God through the law, if you can even do such a crazy thing. But hasn't the wind also been used to push ships across the ocean? Hasn't the wind also been used to bring people from point A to point B? That is the perspective of the Christian life. Think about the picture of the people of Israel. We, we are quick to jump on Israel's enslavement in Israel as a picture of our Christian salvation. And that's true. All of the way that's true. Israel is a picture of Christian salvation. They were enslaved in Egypt. God brings them out and takes them into the promised land. We are enslaved to sin. Christ is our Passover lamb. And yet the Christian isn't just taken out of Egypt. The Christian is brought to the camp, to the promised land, where the temple is. And where the commandments of God were put over them. Because he was the God who brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of of slavery. Salvation comes to Israel freely, without anything of their part, and what God expects is joyful obedience before the God who saved us. And so Paul gives a correction, an anticipated correction of some sort. Of some sort. Justification by faith never overflows, or overthrows the law. On the contrary, Paul says, we uphold the law. We uphold the law as Jesus Christ himself taught us. So that means that as we live in this condition of salvation, we as God's people should not speak ill of the law of God 
in light of the gracious offer of the gospel. Now, not many Christians will discount the need for obedience in the Christian life. Even antinomian theologians, theologians who say we have no more use for the law, even they will not argue, usually anyways, for a complete lawlessness in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but we are much more likely to overthrow the law by considering it a negative aspect of the Christian life. To think of it as something that is a hindrance to our Christian life. What does 1 Timothy 1 verse 8 say? It says, now we know that the law is good. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. You're not pushing that two-ton boulder up the mountain. You're following that two-ton boulder down the mountain. If you are approaching the law in that way, it says, it is good. So if you find yourself suspicious when the law is preached to Christians, if you find yourself getting anxious when the law is applied to life, remember that the law is the natural response of thanksgiving for the person who is justified by faith. That is the trajectory of Scripture. That if you are justified you will be sanctified. If you are declared righteous by faith, you will be holy as God is holy, and a holiness is found in the law of God. The argument in this text is for the person who is justified by faith and wants to leave the law behind. And this text says, may it never be, by no means, Praise God for His law. Not because it leads to my salvation, that will crush me, but praise God for His law because it shows me how I live in light of my salvation. We talked before about how expressions of thanks are a revelation of the heart. We say thank you in these different ways with cards so that people know what we're thinking on the inside. <clears throat> that is our use of the law in response to God. How do I keep myself from despising this gift of God through the sacrifice of Christ? How do I do that? What does the Bible say? By keeping the law. Why does Jesus say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light? <clears throat> because the converted person will delight himself in the law of God. <clears throat> Why does James say that faith without works is dead? Because the one who is justified will also be sanctified. You cannot receive Christ's gifts of life and remain in the ways of death. His burden is light because the extent of the gift of salvation far exceeds the expressions of thanks found in our efforts to have uphold, but uphold the law of God we must. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my suggestions. You will keep my commandments. You will submit yourself to my law. Can you speak and think ill of the very institution that God has given to you to express your thanks to him? What is Paul's answer? By no means. May it never be. So do not speak ill of the law of God in light of the gracious offer of the gospel. And then the second thing, we should never separate our obedience to the law from our thankfulness for salvation. Remember, we, we're coming face to face with this mark that's in Scripture. We don't start with the law, but when God awakens us, we, we take up the law. The, the law in Scripture is important and our uh, is important and our view of grace can become unbalanced but it is true that our view of the law can become unbalanced too maybe even more easily become unbalanced because of our nature and our desire to justify ourselves and so the scripture starts with the law as what shows us sin in verse 20 the apostle paul has done that for by works of the law 
no human being will be justified in his sight. For through the law <coughs> comes knowledge of sin. So the first use of the law is to show us that this law is this boulder that will crush me. And, and I deserve to be crushed by this boulder. That's what the law shows me. It's there to show us <coughs> just how badly we need the blood of Christ to cover the debt incurred by our sin in Adam and our own thoughts, words, and deeds which add to that debt. And that, my friends, must always be remembered. The law always shows you your deficit. But once that perfect righteousness of Christ is applied to you, there's only one expression, and that is thankfulness. Obedience to God is the joyful discussion of the Christian. Keeping the law of God is the thankful expression of the saved person. Keeping the law outside of Christ is the crushing burden of the self-righteous. But does that reality overthrow the law? By no means. We uphold it. Why? Because the law is all we can do to express our thanks to God for salvation. So how does the Christian respond to his justification? There's one unthinkable option for God, uh, for Paul. <clears throat> the unthinkable option is that the Christian responds to justification by saying the law of God doesn't matter. We overthrow the law. We, we ignore its righteous instruction. We, we distrust its teaching. And Paul's assessment of that option is, to say that can never happen. By no means. May it never be. Now, on the contrary, there's only one reasonable option for Paul when it comes to justification by faith. In light of the great gift of salvation, the Christian heart overflows with thanksgiving. And thanksgiving is properly expressed in one way only. To show God your deepest gratitude by seeing His law, and upholding his law. That is not the work of merit. That is not the work of self-righteousness. It is an act of worship. It is an act of praise. Praise to God for salvation in Christ expressed in words and deeds. Let's pray together.